Let's see if this works. We'll test this. All right. So does anyone know what this quote is? Has anyone ever heard this quote? It's Picasso. That's right. That's a little Picasso. A little Picasso painting. But his, his, his point was that everything is derivative. Right? Like he, he, didn't, he didn't invent art. He was a very gifted painter. He was a prodigy, but he didn't, he didn't invent art. And his point was that everyone has good ideas. You could steal them, right? Has anyone ever stole anything? Don't, you don't have to answer. This is, this is an alternative title, and this is, this is the theme of what I've been trying to convince people is the core of, of DevOps, is, is learning. And I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna revisit that theme a few times, but there's, there's a couple themes. Learning and then advantage, sustained advantage. Does anyone want an advantage? Yeah? Who likes to lose? Anyone? No? All right, so this is a word from my sponsor. They pay for me to fly around. Pivotal, transform how the world builds software. And then Andrew, my mission is personally to try to transform how the world operates software. But I'm not doing it alone. I'm doing it with you. Right? So this is an agenda. I'll just let you read it. While I get a drink of water. I took out most of the bike shedding. That was on the agenda earlier, but. Does anyone know what bike shedding is? I'll explain bike shedding later. So this is the introduction. I have done a few things, and I think the best way to frame this is DevOps has been very good to me, and the last 10 years of my life, I've basically been trying to help people build better IT systems with better tools and better processes. And I was heavily influenced by Agile software development and open source, and it's a bunch of this stuff with, you know, everything is touching everything at this point. So these are projects I've been involved with. These are books or events I've helped organize um, or write. And then this is the best methodology for delivering software. It is artisanal retrofuturism crossed with team scale anarcho syndicalism. And if you don't know what that is, well, maybe that's why you're not very good at this. Just kidding. This is the most important slide because it has my Twitter handle. And that's, that's going to be important for your future. And just to make it, you know, mix things up, I wanted to make sure you knew that I come, little idea comes in various phases of beard and hair. So this is important for the next time you see me, especially outside of Asia, I might look very different than I do right now. It's important. I've also got a plethora of uh, videos you can watch on YouTube, or I'll sell you CDs if anyone has a device that still plays CDs from the trunk of my car. Has anyone ever seen me talk before? Besides Sergio and Matt, who's laughing? All right, so this is the most important thing you should do. I'm serious about this. So the most important thing you should do for your tech career is you should learn how to write, you should learn how to speak, you should steal good ideas, and you should follow the little idea on Twitter. <laughs> so moving on, I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you some patterns and some framing about how I see the world. And that is maybe going to be meaningful to you, and maybe it won't be. But one thing to keep in mind here is this notion of bias, selection bias. Has anyone ever heard of survivorship bias or survival bias? So this is a very famous story, and there's a couple other examples, but this is my favorite one, where there was a, a study of the aircraft that were returning from, from war, and they, they were studying where the aircraft had bullet holes, and they decided that where they have bullet holes, they needed to add more armor. But that's actually completely wrong, because the only aircraft that were returning were the ones that weren't lost and it's actually the opposite of where those holes are that are, are, the, are the vital places for that aircraft that need more armor. So there's lots of things that we see that we, we have bias and you could give, and people have given talks about bias and how that frames how we view the world. But what I hope happens a little bit today is that we, we shift some of our bias as a group towards things that help us 
change our behavior and do things. And that's, uh, that's going to be reinforced. So this is the short version of the talk. You are software enabled. How many people work in a company that has said out loud, we are not a software company? Anyone? No? Got a hand up? I, I guarantee more of you have. I, I've been in meetings with executives, probably at companies that you work for, where they said, we're not a software company. Right? Like, we're a bank, we're, we're a manufacturing, like, we do all this other stuff. We're not a software company. It's like, well, that's interesting, because you have like 10,000 developers on payroll, so like, what are you doing with them? Right? So if, you, if you're not software enabled, you're going to lose to someone who is. In the world that we live in, I, I saw a few hands went up when they, when they said cell phones. I got off an airplane in Singapore yesterday morning at 6 a.m. I got out my little supercomputer that I carry in my pocket, and I pushed a button, and a car came and got me at the airport and drove me to this building. Right? Like that, that, is, that was not possible 10 years ago. That was not possible, like, it's, everything has changed, right? It's not the world we were born into. And software is what's eating that, changing that. So the best way to improve development, I, I don't actually believe that in developer happiness. Like I keep hearing people talk about developer happiness. Like what the hell is that? Like give them cocaine. Like what are you talking about? <laughs> like what? It just doesn't make sense at all. I don't understand, but people keep saying it. So the best way to improve development is actually to improve ops. You don't want, I don't, I don't actually want happy developers. I want, I want healthy developers, right? I want a healthy system. I'm trying to think about this whole system, not about your, you know, random mystery meat Docker file that you're building. And then last but not least, you're going to build a le learning organization or you're going to lose to someone who is. And I'm going to define learning organization at the very, very end, but I want to start with this. So where are we and why are we here? When I go to places in the world, and I've never been to Singapore before, I like to read a little bit about their history and the, and, the, and the events that kind of formed that culture. And I learned lots of interesting things along the way, and I've incorporated lots of interesting things from that in how I think about the world. But Singapore literally didn't exist until you know, 70, 80 years ago. Right? It was like created from most of the, like what I learned is most of the land is actually reclaimed from the sea. Right, where, where we are right now was built up from nothing. And I know this is true, that this lion symbolizes courage, strength, and excellence, because I read it on Wikipedia. <laughs> and everyone knows <laughs> that Wikipedia is true. And it also, it also stands for this resilience in the face of challenge. And, and the reason I bring that up is I think that a lot of the challenges that people are facing in IT is basically rebuilding things, re reclaiming things from the sea, right? Especially if you work in, in a legacy situ situation. But why we're here is we want to continuously DevOps microservices or die trying, right? If you're reading Hacker News, does anyone read Hacker News? This is a blog post from O'Reilly Radar from 2007. So it's 10 years old. It's exactly 10 years old now, because it was October. And this blog post is arguing in 2007, 10 years ago, the operations is a competitive advantage. It's the secret sauce of startups. And what it's arguing here is that if you do things with traditional operations, that you're going to have all this toil, that you're going to have all this human work. So that's the number of hours on the, on the y-axis, and then there's the scale of the number of servers on the x-axis. And that this new secret way, the new secret sauce, was, was giving people you know, the competitive advantage. Right? And this is, this is sort of like you know, the golden age of Puppet, 2007. Chef's about to be born, basically. And it's funny because like, we still have to keep saying this stuff. I heard, I heard people in open space yesterday say, is there, is like, is there any data? Or is like, anyone doing anything better? Is there anything faster? And in fact, the data is there. Right? Like, this is not debatable anymore. If you go look at the state of DevOps report and you look at what people are actually doing, what they're reporting they're doing, the, the difference between the high performing teams and the low performing teams in terms of delivering IT, in terms of recovering from failure, it, it is a drastic difference. Right? And if, if, you, if you don't believe that, you're just in denial. Faster is safer, right? And people say that in lots of talks, and I'm going to try to give you a little more than 
than like what you could get from reading a blog post or watching the rest of these talks. But this is this is what's going on. All this stuff. There's a little bit of a problem though, in that the way that gets framed, and, and part of this is the survivorship bias, is that it all just starts to sound like pandas vomiting rainbows. <laughs> and especially if you're in a place that's difficult to deal with. You're dealing with legacy systems, you have a legacy culture, you have legacy <laughs> processes. It's very difficult. And you hear people talk about you know, the fancy stuff they're doing with some new tool or the fancy thing they did with some process. And that's just, that's just, this is hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to bridge the gap between what I should do in the, in the world that I live in and, and this thing that I just saw on Hacker News or on you know, the stage. And everyone wants this pandas bombing rainbows. Who doesn't want that? I mean, come on. But they actually don't want that. Here's what they really want. I mean, they do want the rainbows. They want scalability. They want availability. They want reliability. They want operability. They want usability. They want it all for free, and they want it without changing anything. Right? Who's mad this person? <laughs> Who works for this person? <coughs> Who is this person? You don't have to raise your hand. So to make a point, sometimes I just like to make the words bigger. And I used to get really frustrated with this. And, and you know, some of the work I did and some of the consulting, like I did everything I could and I got emotionally attached to the outcome and I wanted people to succeed. And they're like, we, you know, how can we do the DevOps without changing anything? And it's like, just pay me and I'll go, you know, like, can't help you. But, but what I came to understand, and this is actually a recent thing I've been reading, it's very interesting, is this notion of institutionalization theory. And it kind of finally explains to me why people don't actually want to change, or why they want to change the minimal amount. And, and this curve that some of you should be familiar with, has anyone ever read Crossing the Chasm or is like familiar with this adoption curve? Yes? Yes? So there's this, there's this tendency as things move towards uh, institutionalization that people are doing things not to seek advantage. Right? So in this institutionalization theory um, model, and, and let's, let's be clear, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. The, the early adopters and the innovators are, are seeking advantage. They're trying to seek advantage. At some point, as that advantage becomes clear, as the data demonstrates, the, the, the state of DevOps reports demonstrates that that's clear, people stop actually seeking advantage. Institutions, organizations stop seeking advantage. And what they're actually trying to do is legitimize themselves. What they're actually trying to do is become, quote unquote, legitimate. And so they start to adopt the wording, but they don't adopt the practices. The, the words cross the chasm, but actually changing behavior doesn't, or, or it does much slower, right? And you see the same thing with, with all these waves, with Agile, with the rest of it, right? And, and these are based on, on this model of institutional theory, kind of these three forces that create isomorphic. Um, the isomorphic pressures. And isomorphic means the same, so same shape. So there's, there's copying, there's coercion, and then there's normal. So at the point where something is, you know, the certified accreditation that people want, then that's what they do, right? Like, how many people have scrum masters? Yeah? That's a terrible thing. Like, how the hell can you be a master in two days? <laughs> Give me a break. And then it's further complicated by the fact that these things just keep building and building on each other, right? Like there's not a single wave of change that's happening in tech right now, right? There's this wave of, of configuration management, there's this wave of cloud, there's this wave of DevOps, like all of them are superimposed on each other, right? And so it's very hard to kind of keep that, that straight, unless you're, I, I think you, you, you have this tension between learning about all the stuff that's changing and like actually doing anything useful in your life, right? Getting any work done. This is a very famous painting, and I love it. And it's um, basically these waves are going to crash. If you have waves crashing, then that is potentially bad, but it can also be potentially awesome, right? Has anyone surfed before? Yeah? So warning, surfing is hard. Has anyone ever ate crap in the surf, in the breakers? Yeah. The waves will pummel you. And, and I also want to, like, just fair warning, software is actually hard, too. It's not pandas vomiting rainbows. Software was always hard. People talk about the, the, the renaissance and you know, the, the collaboration and all these metrics and the pandas vomiting rainbows. But I was there, and it often felt a little more like this. Right? 
And this is actually a picture of me trying to manage OpenStack. <laughs> right? It, like, it was all mud and blood. And you try to tell people it's hard, and they're like, and they're like well, I'm just going to build an OpenStack public cloud and somehow <laughs> become a service provider. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, cool story. <laughs> but this is, this is how I kind of came to frame my understanding of DevOps and software, the five stages. <laughs> what stage are you in? Depression. depression? I heard some depression. <laughs> so this is how I frame DevOps. In my own understanding as Andrew, I wrote a blog post in 2010 that kind of had these three bullet points, which I think are still true now, but I've simplified it, and I'll give you my working definition today in a moment. And that is that developers and operations can and should work together. I don't think that's controversial, although sometimes it seems hard in organizations. That system administration is evolving to look more and more like software development. So in 2010, you know, EC2 has been out for a while, Puppet's been out for a while. You had the ability to provision systems with APIs. You had the ability to configure systems with APIs. You had the ability to do things with monitoring with APIs. All this stuff that was, was traditionally operations work looks suspiciously like software development. If you're writing against APIs, that's software development. And you can take all the lessons that you learned and all the tools that you have to do software development you know, with respect to planning, with respect to version control, the rest of that, and we can apply that to, so to um, operations work. And then last but not least, and I think this is actually the most important one, and this is what brings me to places like Singapore, is that we are a global community of practice, sharing solutions that the solutions that we have and that the problems that we have are similar and that we should help each other do them. And then and the, all, these, all these communities are doing that. Is, is anyone on Slack or IRC channels talking to people about the tools and processes? I mean, there's a lot of great communities to be part of right now. And if you're not part of communities right now, like, you should become part of communities. And then this is a model that I'm very fond of, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this model um, a lot for the rest of the talk, um, is, is stealing from my friend um, John Willis and um, Damon. Edwards is, is this mo model of CAMS. And they, they started with CAMS, and then um, I like adding lean because I think saying columns is way better than saying CAMS, but it's this notion of culture, automation, lean metrics, and sharing. I'm going to break those down a bit more as we go. But my most simple version of, of DevOps, so what DevOps means to me 2017, is DevOps is optimizing human performance and experience operating software with software <coughs> and with humans. Right? This notion of a social technical system. That it's not all about humans, it's not all about tools. It's both of them are one thing, one system. And software is hard, but humans are harder. And here's a little aside. So these are humans, and these are humans I trained martial arts with in my life. So I just put them up there. Um, and the reason I put this up here to transition from this notion of humans is what I learned from my practice, you know, when I was young and not slow, um, is <laughs> that the, the principles are actually more important than the practices. That if, if you get locked in this notion of what the technique is, and then someone throws a punch slightly different, like you're in trouble, right? The punch that hits you is never wrong. The punch that hits you is not the wrong punch, right? So you have to understand the principles and apply them in real time, not, not something that you did as a ritual. And if you don't put principles into practice, they're worthless, right? So a lot of times you have this opposite thing where people get so, so caught up in their mental models of how things should work that they don't actually, they can't actually fight anymore. It's like lost, especially in, as we move to these cultures that are more and more nonviolent, which I kind of like, you know, not being fighting all the time. But in the old, old world, like it wasn't a theory, right? Like you either died or you didn't, right? And that's the survivorship bias again. And then the other thing I learned, which I, I believe is, is very useful, is that if you don't have the intention to do better, to win, to whatever, have that advantage, you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good your technique is. If someone else has more intention to kick your ass, they will. But you can have both. And I never really cared about any belts or ranks or whatever. Like the only system that I care about is like you can either beat me or you can't. Right? And, and that, that's manifest in lots of ways. And you get a lot of feedback when someone punches you. Right? or choke you or whatever. So I was never interested in being DevOps. Like this is a, a thing that happened not because anyone wanted to be DevOps. P 
People wanted competitive advantage. People wanted to win. People were trying to solve problems. That competitive advantage is what drove all this stuff we're talking about. That's like without that impetus to have a competitive advantage, and that's, that's in the curve, right? The institutionalization curve is those initial innovations are driven by the desire for an advantage. And it's cool that you just want to do anything um, from ritual. Does anyone know what cargo cults are? No? This is very fascinating human behavior. So the, the cargo culting is typically referred to in like sociology, archaeology, those kind of things. It's a, it's a reference to a group of uh, indigenous people in the South Pacific that happened to be on an island where the U.S. built a base during a war. And they were flying these planes full of supplies onto the island. And the, and the people there decided those were gods sending stuff from heaven. And when the people left the base, they built a, essentially a religious ritual and practice around, they, they would build these coconut earphones and they would make the, these um, things and they make these straw airplanes to try to get the gods to bring back the, the goods, right? But they, they didn't understand. And it's cool that people go through and like they copy the thing that they saw in the blog post or the conference talk, but they're not gonna get an understanding of what that person like actually did just by doing the, the ritual with the coconuts, right? It won't deliver better software. So here, here's something I added um, from conversation yesterday. So ITIL is sort of this last wave, right? And people are talking about implementing ITIL. And ITIL probably seemed like a good idea once upon a time, right? The, the idea is basically we're gonna minimize the number of incidents we have by going really slow by making sure everyone checks off and signs off and thinks about it really hard and then we'll think about it again and then we'll sign a thing and then we'll think about it some more and then we'll sign another thing, right? And that's cool, but like we moved on from that, right? There's, there's, there's ways to do things better and we're not thinking about, we're, we're basically not gonna think about minimizing incidents, we're gonna think about minimizing the time to recover and we're also gonna get rid of a whole host of complexity. There's a bunch of questions about complexity yesterday that you can solve a lot of your complexity problems by collapsing them to not have them, right? So in, in the cloud native world, you don't have a, a, a different configuration for every possible machine that's like with a project, the moves through thing. You build racks and racks and racks of identical stuff. You collapse the complexity at the bottom. You make people build on top of that and you spend all your complexity budget delivering value at the top of the pyramid. And that's what, I mean, if you look at the first version of EC2, it came out, there's like three different instance sizes. That's it. Like, there's no networking model. It's all L3, right? There's, there's none of this stuff that people do with, like, complicated um, architectures. And ITIL is not how the web's built. It's a, it's a huge disadvantage now. It's a huge disadvantage. So this is a question I want you to seriously ask yourself. If you're working on implementing ITIL today, are you doing that for some advantage? Or are you doing that because everyone else does? Or everyone else did? In your, in your like, little vertical, right? You're just doing that to be normative. You're just doing that because that's, that's the professional thing to do. It's not gonna help you win. The other thing, and this is, I, I verified this because people are saying, oh, ITIL has this notion of separation and responsibility, and how do you do that? ITIL does not say that. ITIL got implemented that way, and that's been copied and coerced and normalized. But if you go look at what ITIL actually says, that's not what it says. So this is this traditional IT model. We're gonna put a wall of confusion between everyone. Don't let them talk to each other except through the ticket system. Wonder why everyone's unhappy. And then, and then there's shenanigans, right? <laughs> who, who does this? That's the digital transformation. Yeah, that, this is the transformation. But, but in reality, these are actually just, they're, they're opposing forces. They're at odds with each other in some ways by design. Like ops is there to, do things that are stabilized and dev is there to make things happen. But the reality is your, your business, your, your, your organization, whatever, doesn't really get differentiating value for all this other stuff. And this could be, you know, this could add more and more stuff. But the point I actually want to make here is this all software, right? To the very bottom until there's actually silicon. It's all software. And that in organizations that you have operational responsibilities at all of them. So when people talk about 
oh, you know, developers are going to have this operational burden for running their, their application. No, they're not actually going to have that much operational burden. They just have a little tiny bit of operational burden at the very, very top of the, of the iceberg, right? For their application that they wrote. Like, they don't have to understand how networking works. They don't have to understand how storage works. Like, just make the logic of your thing not, you know, bring down the database too often. Like, that's all I'm asking. And this, this practice of operations is moving, right? So what we call operations today is going to look very different tomorrow, right? And it already does from 10 years ago. And, and you know, it's changing even now. So serverless, whatever. Like, there's a next wave of this changing. So the task will change, but someone should make sure things actually work. Who's with me? I, I never understand the developers who are like, they commit code, they deploy, and then it's like, it's literally busted. And you're like, you never even ran this thing. So like, why did you go home on Friday? Anyway. So people, people often refer to Amazon as like this innovator on cloud, and they just certainly did some things and should get credit for bringing it to market. Um, not that they're, I'm going to talk a little bit about Google in a minute too, but this is a quote from 2006. So this is the year that EC2 was launched. And Amazon already had a, a decade of, of managing the you know, large-scale e-commerce infrastructure they had. So this, this quote, and I'll just read it. The traditional model is that you take your software to the wall that separates development operations. You throw it over and then forget about it. Not at Amazon. You build it, you run it. That brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. It also brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. The customer feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of the service. Now, I know people that were working at Amazon, you know, Jesse, you, Robin, some of these other people were there at this time, and it doesn't mean that all these developers were operating the, the networking and the storage, right? Like, they, they were operating their service, right? And we need to, as a, as a community, understand what that means. When I say your developers should wear pagers, it does not mean your developers will now do every task that sysadmins used to do. Who knows what that is? So this is, this is a model I've been using, um, and it's the, it's the Chinese five elements from Chinese medicine. And the reason I like this model is it sort of maps to the five things that, that you know, the five pillars of, of DevOps in a way that I want to point out that they're not, they're not separate. They, they reinforce each other. And in some ways, they, they sometimes kind of um, destroy each other too, right? So there's these cycles of creation and destruction. So I'm going to walk through this model really quick. So culture, you know, people say all this stuff about culture. This is a, 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 a spectrum of culture. So this is the Western topology model, and it talks about pathological cultures, bureaucratic cultures, and generative cultures. And then it has a bunch of things that categorize each of those. And so what I'm going to try to do copying off Western is sort of bring that notion of a spectrum to like all the five um, elements. And, and, and I think that if you read these, most of us you know, that are sane people We'll read this and think things like novelty crushed is probably not a good thing if you're trying to innovate around software, right? How many, how many people work in an organization where they feel that it's generative? Right? It ebbs and flows, right? This, this is at least, you know, you don't have to say anything or not or agree, but I think it's easy to say the things on one end of the spectrum are probably better than things on the other. If you're, if you're actually trying to generate, create, innovate, any of this stuff. So this, these cultural ideas are really, to me, around aligning in incentives and interests. So when people talk about the problem with silos, the problem is not that you have silos. The problem is that you have misaligned interests and information hiding. Right? People are, people are strategically politicizing the work instead of, instead of doing the right thing for the organization. And one of the things that really, really hurts IT in general is this notion of the framing of a cost center versus a competitive advantage. In much of IT, you even have CTOs that report to the, to the um, CFO, right? And so when you framed everything as a cost center, then you get very different behavior than if you're actually trying to drive competitive advantage. Right? You're, you're often under-resourced. There's a bunch of problems that come out of that. And, and probably most people in this room aren't in a, in a situation to refactor 
your organization, but you should at least know that this is possible. And, and there's, there's other organizations, right? So one of the things I'm fond of saying is you should change your organization or you should change your organization. So automation is this thing that we all get excited about. I'm going to add that it's actually also quite a bit about architecture. And, and you go through this phase when you start learning about these tools that you want to automate everything. And that's very exciting. And you know you got your, your favorite tool, and you're going to do that. And then um, you start building stuff. And, and has anyone ever built this? This is automation, right? No? I'm going to say this is not automation. That's manual. This is automation. Right? And, and the point I want to make here is that what we automate is, is often as important as what we do, right? And there's things that you can try to automate that will resist automation. They weren't designed to be automated. They were designed before this. And so it's a huge opportunity when you, when you go and, and you do these kind of projects to revisit why things exist. And you don't want to lose that opportunity. It is a, it is a failure to just take what exists and automate it with the new, with the new tools, right? And, and if you do that, you're going to take things and you know, maybe you got this um, container thing and you're going to just put it all in containers and we're going to schedule it. It's going to be awesome. Except for that doesn't actually help. Because what you really got out of that for the most part was just the, 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 the sysadmin didn't have to restart the process. Right? Like you didn't get very, you, you didn't get a lot of advantages around the, the way that those things fail, the way those things um, actually are, can be operated. You just got the ability to restart it and like, let the scheduler do stuff. Does anyone ever play Tetris? Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have lived this, um, or you're about to. So this spectrum for, for me, I think on the, on the one end you have a bunch of toil, humans doing work. In the middle you've started to script things, and then on this, on this far end you're starting to have the, the software itself as a platform that's providing lots of these pieces for you. Right? And, and when I say platform, I don't mean things like um, you know, Cloud Foundry or, or Kubernetes or whatever. I mean more like the platform is your organization. It's specific to you. It does whatever it needs to do to be, to be able to, to take care of the, the business you, you're in. Right? And that's, a, that's evolving rapidly, those capabilities. Has anyone ever read the Borg paper? Does anyone know what the Borg is? Yeah. So all this stuff is inspired by Borg. Mesos, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes is all inspired by Borg. It's a tool that was built internally um, to run all the stuff that Google does. And they've run it you know, for a while. They got some good ideas. They just published a paper. I remember back in the day, 2008, and Puppet was doing lots of work with Google. They were managing 30,000 machines with Puppet. Um, and they would not talk to you about Borg. If you said the word Borg in a room with people that worked at Google, they would all look at each other and then stop talking to you for the rest of the night until he got him really drunk. Um, but this is the most important sentence, most important piece of the Borg paper. So all this stuff about, about container scheduling and the rest of that, this is actually more important, in my opinion. And it's overlooked. Every task run under Borg contains a built-in HTTP server that publishes information about the health of the task and thousands of performance metrics. If your software tells you when it's healthy, you have huge advantage over trying to come after the fact and put monitoring on it, right? So get, getting that is a, is a huge thing. So that takes us to metrics. This is, the, this is from the service reliability, site reliability book, and the service reliability hierarchy, which I don't know why they switch back and forth between service and site in their own writing, but this, this base of the pyramid from a Google perspective, this is Google telling you how they do things, is, is monitoring. So service level objectives, I'm going to come back to that a little bit, Later, what are your service low objectives? Does anyone know what that means? Does anyone know what their service low objectives are? This is language that I hope we all adopt as an industry. Steal it from Google. What are your service low objectives? And, and how do you know if you're meeting them? What are your service level indicators? So, so this next phase is, the, is adding to this idea of the evolution. I'm going to come back to that, actually. I, this is, I, I didn't set this up as properly as I could have, but there's this notion of, of the S-curve of commoditization, is that things start as an innovation. This is stealing from Simon Wardley. Start as an innovation, and then they move up to commoditize. So in IT, what we've seen, what cloud computing actually represents, is a movement from innovation to a commoditization to this utility model. And that, that slide was probably a little bit out of place. But the, the spectrum for monitoring is at the level of insight. So now there's this massive 
uh, debate slash discussion around observability. Is anyone following this discussion? So, so there's, we, we've moved from unmonitored to having some base-like understanding that we should have some metrics to now getting really, really fine-grained tools, being able to ask questions about the, the software that we're writing. And we're coming to the home stretch of this model. So there's a notion of sharing. So we're a global community of practice, right? Like group hug. Everyone smiles. And then people have this, this wall of confusion between their dev and their ops. And they think the way we're going to solve that internally is we're going to make a new silo. So we're going to solve our problem with silos by adding a new silo. I'm going to say you shouldn't do that. Not, not because you shouldn't have silos, but because that won't actually solve the problem of silos. Just don't do that. What you actually want to be able to do, and this is oversimplified, is that because because developers are not a monolith, right? And developers on the front end are not the same as the developers on the back end. And then operations, we already talked about the stratification of, of the of the platform up through, you know, from the bottom of the hardware up through the services to do some things like deployment and monitoring. Each of those have their own operational aspects. And then let's not forget the business. That's probably a good idea to have something that makes this get paid. And then, you know, last but not least, but they, they should always be the least and on the bottom, is security. What we actually want to do is create these communities of interest. So each of these in its own right is a community of practice, has notions of excellence, has notions of best practices. And then inside of our organizations, we want to be connected and sharing information and aligning incentives to, to deliver value as a community of interest across all of these concerns. So this is, uh, this is my little model spectrum. Um, in, in terms of sharing, that in pathological situations, there's a lot of information that's hidden, there's very strong silos, everything is secret, and then in the middle, you may get a little bit more alignment and you're starting to, to have things that are secret to the company, but they may be shared internally. And then last but not least, I think that the, you know, the highest evolution of this is participating in global community of practice. And I can, you know, I could call Matt Ray in Australia anytime and ask him questions about Habitat and he'll probably answer them. Right? And, and you could too. And then last but not least, Lean actually subsumes all this stuff. If you go look at Lean and what that model talked about and what they, they did in that community, you know, it got sort of started in manufacturing, but it has this notion of continuous improvement. And I think that's, that's what I like adding Lean for. And so it's not just about having metrics. It's not just about having culture. It's about continuously improving. The notion of continuously improving that stuff. And also because Calm sounds way better than Cam's. So that's a little you know, whirlwind walk through this notion of the five, five pillars, this five model. We can talk about it in the open space later. And he, here's a you know, ham-fisted attempt to kind of build uh, the spectrum so that you can see the, the, at least a framing that I like about what is better and what is worse for each of these five. And then this is just me being funny because you got to get that chi to flow, right? So coming into to the end, towards the end, there's still, there's still a bunch of slides, but I'm going to go really fast. So what I want you to understand is the context is key, right? And that scale breaks everything. And I, I said this yesterday in the open space. So there's this ant. And ants can lift 50 times their body weight, right? And they're very, very humble about it. I can lift 50 times my body weight. Eh. And then there's elephants, and they're big, and you know, they spend all day eating, right? So can you have an elephant-sized ant? Well, there's a problem, and that's that the physics get in the way, right? So you have this thing called the square cube law, and that is that when scaling a physical object, the new surface area is proportional to the square of the multiplier, and the new volume is proportional to the cube of the multiplier, which means that the elephant needs to have bigger bones, right? The ant actually breathes oxygen through its exoskeleton, and if you tried to make an elephant-sized ant, it would require hurricane-strength winds to drive enough air over the pores in its skin or its, its exoskeleton to even have a chance to die. And then if it tried to move, it would immediately die. It would just crush itself, right? So lots of DevOps conversations sound like, hey, I can lift 50 times my body weight, right? When, you, when you're getting advice from, from the people on, on you know, whatever conference and they have this little startup and they're like, we did this fancy thing, it's like, well, I work at an elephant, right? And like, if I try that, everyone will die. So what's the organizational equivalent of the square cube law? I don't know either, but I know scale breaks everything. 
And DevOps at scale, there's an existence proof that, that there's this way to do things at Google, and it's free. And you should go read this book. So this Site Reliability Engineering book has a bunch of great things from Google, and I'm going to give you some homework in a minute, but sharing is caring. Right? They're part of this global community of practice. It took them a while. They used to be secret about Borg, but now they're sharing, and you can read the book. Right? All these things that I said about developers and operations working together, solving system administration with software, and participating in global community, it's all in that book. Right? The five check marks. But the thing you, you, you start to realize when you read this is that SREs are actually architects too. Like they're basically architects, governance, compliance of the way Google does stuff. Right? They change that whole mental model about how they do security, how they do the rest of it because of the way that that, that process and the, and the software first mentality changed everything. So this is actually a quote from the book. So another way, perhaps the best, is to short circuit the process by which specially created systems with lots of individual variation end up arriving at SRE's door. Provide product development with the platform of SRE validated infrastructure upon which they can build their systems. This platform will have the double benefit of both being reliable and scalable. You collapse the complexity by giving people solutions that don't have that complexity. Right? You, you make that problem go away. The SRE builds framework modules to implement canonical solutions for the concern production area. As a result, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework takes care of correct infrastructure use. So people read about SRE and they're like, oh, the SREs took the burden from the software developers. They took the burden of production. It's actually wrong. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a benefit to get SRE support inside Google. And most projects start without it. Right, so developers are actually the operations for their own stuff on the services. They, they have the, the, full, the full palette of, of you know, Google's platform to build with, but they're the one that run their service until the SREs get involved. But the goal is not to take the operational burden from the software developers. The goal is to make the operational burden negligible. Right, so we're trying to eliminate toil by making those tools, making those libraries, making those modules reduce the cost of operations. So this is your homework. I want you to read Embracing Risk, Service Level Objectives, and Eliminating Toil from the free book that you can get if you search SRE. SRE book, you should read that. So what are your service level objectives? You should tell me next time I talk to you. And we don't get to decide when the competition gets an advantage, but we can decide to learn and we can decide to act. And I've been to lots of places, I've had people read the same books, been to the same conferences, given the same advice, the same tools, same resources, basically the same organizations. Everything about them looks the same, but they get drastically different results. Why is that? Well, what I, what I came to realize is that that's correlated with their ability to change their behavior. So learning, is, to me, is about change behavior. If you're trying to learn to play chess, if you're trying to learn to play music, you're not better until you can beat someone better. You're not better at music until you can play the new song. Right? And that's really easy to measure. In, in organizations and in delivering IT, we're not always good at that. So this is a model. All models are wrong. Some models are useful about organizational learning. I, I, what I recommend you do is read the organizational um, learning model. And there's a questionnaire. And take the ideas from the questions and reframe them as statements. And I don't have time to go into all this stuff, but if, if, you're, if you're in a place where people are continuously learning, everyone can ask questions, the team's learning, everyone's empowered regardless of their rank, you have a model for how you communicate, the system's connected and your leadership's strategic, you're probably going to have a pretty good time. So very, 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 very big finish, come to the end. You haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. This is one of my friends, I hope it's not you. I'll just let you read it. So saying DevOps does not fix a pathological culture. Saying DevOps does not fill a lack of vision. Saying DevOps does not align incentives and interests. You haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. Software is creative. Software is complex. Software is not digging ditches. Software is not running factories. Software is closer to art than science. The principles are more important than the practices, more important than the tools. I didn't really talk about tools at all today. The mindsets are more important than the skill sets are more important than the tool sets. Adapting is more important than adopting. Why is more important than what? So this is my call to action. Invest in yourself by investing in your community. Don't attach your identity to your tasks. To be is to do. Talk does not cook rice. Eliminate toil. Change your behavior. Change your behavior. Change your behavior. 
Good ideas are for everyone. Steal them and then give them away. So these problems are not technical. They're not people. The problem is social technical. It's one system all together. And you have to solve both of them. So let's build better software. Let's build better organizations. And let's build a better world. We can change everything. Again, I'm going to keep saying this. You haven't learned anything until you're changing behavior. So here's what you need to succeed. You need courage, strength, excellence and resilience in the face of challenges. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to have conversations. Yes. We'll have the open space later. Last but not least, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And, uh,